Hi everyone, today we're building Dan's new 1.6 engine. Um, I say new, but it's the same one that came out of his last green car that was rotten. We've just taken it apart, sent it off to the machine shop to be rehoned for new rings on standard size pistons. It's been balanced like most of the engines that we do. And the next step is really to throw it all together, build that empty block into something that actually runs. In order to do that, we've got a pile of parts. Some of these parts have been stored now for the last at least two months in cling film and need to be cleaned. Uh, that's the secret really to engine building. You just clean everything over and over again. We've got a gasket set because he's putting big boosts through it and the 1.6 head gaskets are not multi-layer steel, they're composite. We've got a cometic head gasket, standard size because he's using his old standard pistons. We've got max speeding rods. We've got King Racing bearings, NPR rings, still got his standard cams, but the difference this time is he'll have a Mark II head, which means he gets lifters with solid shim on them rather than hydraulic and a slightly better port angle. We've got billet gears. Other than that, it's all normal stuff. Oh, almost forgot. He's bought some uh, Hot Boy cam wheels for his standard cams for some reason. We won't question the logic there, but it'll make it look good, won't it? So I guess step one, Begin cleaning. Now that all the uh, preliminary cleaning has been finished, uh, it took a long time, always takes a long time. It's time to measure what's going on in these bores. We're gonna measure this after the machine shop has honed it as they have to make sure it's still square. In order to measure the bores, we'll use a dial bore gauge. So we've got our bore gauge set up to test for taper and um, egging right now. Typically I do three measurements, top, middle and bottom on both planes, so uh, that way and that way. That way we get our egging measurement and our taper measurement, and we can then measure our piston, figure out exactly what our skirt to wall clearance is by doing the maths. Because we're about to scrape metal on our nicely um, nicely machined bore, we nice like to put a nice light skim of oil on there. Oh, that's a problem with a 1.6, you can barely get your hands in it. You need bigger bores. And now when we put this in, we'll rock it across and then we'll look at our dial indicator and as it's moving, you'll see that there'll be a maximum amount it goes to. That is the number we want to note down and that's the number we'll be doing the maths on. Pistons grow when they get hot. That measurement is critical in most engine builds. In this case, we're putting stock pistons in this bore so it's less critical, but most of our uh, builds that we do use forged pistons. Forged pistons grow differently as well. So every manufacturer has a minimum spec for skirt clearance. The um, spec changes a bit based on what you're doing. If you're doing a turbo track car, you're gonna want more than the recommended minimum. If you're doing just an NA street car, the recommended minimum is enough. So now that we have got our bore measurements, we'll measure a piston 
At that point there, they are 77.97 mil. So now if we take that measurement from our known bore measurement, we get our clearance measurement, um, which in this case, because that was piston number one, our number one bore was 78.02, and our piston was 77.97. That gives us a 0.05 of a millimeter of clearance. If I was prepared, I'd check that against the factory service manual. But having done a few of these stock piston builds, I know that's fairly atypical. Time to gap our rings. And in order to do that, we have to push it in. Some pistons are like this one, pretty flat on the top. So you can use it as a guide to flatten. The best way of doing it would be to leave an old compression ring in the top. That way when you push it down, there's a hard stop. You don't have to think about it, there's no guesswork. We'll grab our feeler gauge. We'll find our target measurement in here. This is the top ring, so we were targeting 16. Yep, these don't need gapping. <laughs> that is quite a firm fit, the 17. So right out of the box, that ring is 17 top, which luckily matches our standard spec that we'd like to go for. So we'll accept it. We've just finished uh, checking these NPR rings. Well, the gap is slightly larger than I wanted. It's only one thou larger on the top ring. Um, it's four thou larger on the bottom ring, <laughs> which is a little bit more annoying, but they are consistent across the board. Um, it does mean that there's no need to gap anything in this case. Now we're gonna measure the crank journals, make sure they are all consistent, all within spec. So that journal on that plane, according to this micrometer, is 49.952 millimeters. Now we know the measurements of the journals, it's time to measure our bearing clearances. Which there are two ways of doing. Um, you can use your dial bore gauge to measure the bearings when they're torqued in empty main caps. Um, what I find when you do that is that the nice coating on these cool bearings gets destroyed. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the bearing, but because of that, I tend to prefer the old plastic gauge route unless I see uh, an issue that needs to be looked at. Bearings have a tang on the corner of one side and there's a matching tang in the block. You place your uh, bearing tang in there and then pull your bearing in as you're pushing it down. The block webbing is very sharp and you can scrape the hole on the side of the bearing. Exactly the same on the cap side. Put your tang in the hole on the groove and then force the bearing in and push it home. Uh, simple. We're going to be measuring the bearing clearances with plastic gauge, which means we're going to put a bit of plastic on here to squish with the torque, which means we do not want the plastic gauge to go in the oiling hole of the crank. All these have been cleaned out. Uh, so we're going to put it in at a slight angle. And because we're measuring the bearing clearances, we're not doing it with any lubrication on the bearings. So when this goes in, we do not want to rotate the crank afterwards. We're using original main bolts which the torque spec requires oil as a lubricant. So in order to check the clearances of plastic gauge, we've got to torque all these down. So now the crank is in temporarily. Next step is to remove a main cap in turn, put a piece of plastic gauge in it, torque it up, check it. I've got a brake bar if you need one. <laughs> it would look less dramatic, wouldn't it? It would look less dramatic. <laughs> I don't know, dramatic is what we should be going for during an engine build. How else are we going to get people to stay interested? It's a piece of plastic age. It's effectively just a squashable plastic that we need to put on our journal right there. it looks like. So we'll say it's 1.75. Uh, we just finished checking all the oil clearances on this, the mains and the rods. Everything is within a spec we like to see. In this case, it's about 1.8 to 1.9 thou. Typically on a high performance turbo engine, we aim for about two. Um, stock clearance, I think, is around 1.8 on the top end of it. So we're a little bit looser than stock, and that's always a good thing in this case. Um, next thing we've got to do is we've got to put the crank in 
And as I just say that while holding the pen, I notice there's holes still, because we haven't put the oil squirters in. We should do that first, because they're a bit of a pain to reach otherwise. So that's the next thing. So now our squirters are in, when they're easy to access, we've got to put the crank in. In order to do that, we need to lubricate our bearings with our assembly loop. Go a bit overkill, put some on here. This one's the thrust face for the thrust washers because it's way bigger. Drop it in. Crank is in. Now we've got to do the same for all these main caps. Lubricate them, chuck them on. So we'll start each of these couple of threads. Talking it down, two stages in the spiral. Stock pistons have this little circle clip. So stick the uh, tail in the groove. So when you're holding it, push with your thumb and twist with the pliers. Push down and it will clip in. And you can see it's fully clipped in all around. This one isn't at the top. So we just have to push it in. It's much easier to get these in properly. Yeah. Uh, if you, when you push the pin in, you leave a little bit out of the boss, enough to still be able to get your rod in. That way you can slide it over and you know you're located. So we'll do that after lubricating the little end bush. And again, we'll locate the front of the engine, orientate this to match, put it over our hole and push it in. So we'll shove our pin in. Exactly the same way we always do, by grabbing it, pushing your thumb and twisting it in. Now we've got the, uh, the rods on their pistons, or the pistons on their rods, we've got to put the rings in. Um, I broke my ring pliers, so we're going to do it by hand very, very carefully. Um, which now means when I'm looking at it, I'm regretting not doing that before I put the, uh, before I put the rods on. It's going to be quite difficult to hold it. Tell you what, let's get a vise. If you get a vise, it'd be easier. Always useful to have a vise that isn't bolted down. We won't worry too much about aligning the ring gaps right now. We'll do that just before it goes in the ring compressor before it goes in the engine. So first, always start at the bottom, work your way up. And it's always, I find, much easier to put the waffle in before you put the rails in. Spread it gently, shove it in. Got the two rails. These are very flexible. Walk it down the piston without scoring the side of the piston. And because this is the first one, stick it under the waffle. All the way around, under the waffle. There you are. We'll get our second ring in. These have to be installed with the groove facing down. Second ring in. The first ring, again, has a mark typically on the top face. So you just make sure the mark is pointing up. And repeat the process. This one's even harder to spread because it's a harder ring, uh, but it doesn't have to go as far. So silver linings. Now we've got all the rings on one piston. Repeat for all the others. Got our rings on our pistons now. So they need to go in here. So we're going to be putting one and four in. Find the front of the piston, which, as we know from before, is that notch in the front. And we've got a uh, generic compressor. Tighten it up. If we were going to drop it in the bore now, because there's nothing sticking out, it'd be quite difficult to align it. So you just grab the back of a hammer and start tapping it down. So we have a decent amount of a uh, skirt poking out the bottom. That makes it far easier to get the piston in the right way around and in one hit. And you have to hold it down 
and I like to tap it down a bit until I know roughly when the rings are going to come in. I know that from doing it many times. You'll just have to, when you feel like you're about to get to the right location, really push down and then give it a good whack into the bore. So now we'll align our rod with the journal and push it up slowly so we don't hit it and damage anything. Now we can put our cap on. Important thing to note with the rod caps is that they have numbers on one side. The number, the big number on it, will match the big number of its match rod. So if you do mix them up, you have to get that correct again. But the numbers have to go on the same side. We are using ARP bolts for these. The torque spec for them is only correct if you're also using ARP thread lubricant. All four rods and pistons are now in the engine. So we've got to torque it down. The max speeding rods come with a booklet that tells you what the torque setting should be for the rod bolt size. These are the tiny rod bolts. So it's the smallest torque setting. It's alarmingly low. It tells us we've got to go about 28 foot pounds, which doesn't feel like a lot for the most important component <laughs> in the engine. All the way around until we've done all of them. The next uh, most interesting thing this engine has to do is we have a an oil pump to build. This car is getting a set of billet gears and these ones are being tested. So we'll find out how good they are. These ones are perfectly serviceable, but a high RPM, high load, shock loading is uh, liable to break these. We also have a boundary shim to put in here. We're going at only a 66 PSI in this case. These clearances for these gears have been checked in this pump before but we'll do it again now just so you can see what we checked. So if you're doing it at home, you'll know what to look for. And we're gonna take three main measurements for this. So if we wanna check the outer one, we'll grab the gears and pull them all the way, and then we'll check the opposite side. So I'm using the four thou feeler gauge because that's what we, we know this clearance is. The next one, we'll check tip to tip. So we'll hold the two together and then we'll shove a feeler gauge between them final one to check. We're just going to hold down on it as if we screwed it together and then slide the feeler gauges in from the middle. So with our clearances checked we'll just pull these gears back out again and then uh, liberally fill it all up. But now we've got to put our shim in. We've got to get the split pin out without letting everything in there fly out put it across the spring seat, push down, and then you should be able to pull this out. We get a lot of questions about where you put the shim in the boundary pump setup. Inside there, there's a piston, which is your bypass valve piston. There's a spring, and there's a seat. And the seat fits neatly over the spring. You'll put your shim on top of your spring seat. It's far easier to install, and this shim is pretty much the same size as the bore, so you don't really want it moving. So you stick it right at the bottom, right before your, your clip. So really, we're gonna leave it there for this video, I think. Uh, this was only a very, very quick overview of what engine blueprinting is like. If you wanna see a real way of doing it, you can look up uh, Jaffa Mobile on YouTube. He's got a Blueprinting 101 series excruciating detail there so you can learn as much as you want to learn about it anyone can actually do it just remember that if you do it you need a 12 point socket set not a six point point. and if you have any questions about engine building you can call us we're more than happy to ask about it uh, tell you about it we do offer engine building services as well um, people have been taking us up on that all sorts of things we offer forged pistons otherwise just like comment subscribe check the website for all the all the cool parts we offer and we'll see you in the next video